Okay, welcome everyone. It's time to start. Okay. Thank you. If everyone find a seat and great. So welcome everyone. My name is Linda Hershkovitz and I'm the president of the New Israel Fund of Canada. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that here in Toronto, we're on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples, and that this is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I also acknowledge that Toronto was covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, please come in. <laughs> Those of you who are joining us from elsewhere in Canada and therefore sit in different indigenous territory, I encourage you to take a moment to reflect and acknowledge this wherever you are. So how things have changed in a week. When we first invited you to this year's Shira Herzog Symposium, we originally planned to talk about the democratic crisis in Israel. Instead, the enormity of this week's shocking and terrifying days in Israel are now first and foremost in our minds. We felt that continuing with this gathering was still important, but that a different focus was needed. And so we gather today in order to comfort each other to grieve, and to hear how our community in Israel is responding in this moment. Whether you're joining us online or here in this room, we are here for each other. Today we still gather to celebrate defiance, defiance against terror and extremism, against giving up hope, and against allowing violence to drive Jews and Arabs further apart. On the ground right now, Israelis of all walks of life are still reeling, mourning, and scared. The cruelty of Hamas's heinous terrorism is still difficult to comprehend. The body count is rising. These are days of extraordinary heartbreak. On top of it all, we are worried sick about the 150 hostages held in the Gaza Strip. Among them are Israelis of all ages, soldiers and civilians, the elderly, young children, as well as Jewish and Bedouin citizens of Israel, Thai foreign workers, and citizens of the US, Germany, France, and Canada. Among them, among them, all, are sorry, among them all are believed to be two Canadians, Tiferet Lapidot and Vivian Silver. Vivian, in particular, is known to many of us in this room right now, <coughs> excuse me, and online from Victoria to Halifax. She's a lifelong member of Israel's feminist and peace movements, including deep personal ties to the people and organizations of the New Israel Fund around the world. As Canadians and as believers in peace, Vivian's peril reaches many of us personally. To help us reflect, I'd now like to invite Aviva Chernik to the podium. This melody came to me this week, and I've put it together with words from different parts of Jewish liturgy. Some of the words are from Tachanun, daily prayer of supplication. Some of the words are from Halal, the service of praise that we recite on festivals and on a day like this, Rosh Chodesh, the new month 
today, the new month of Mar Cheshvan. Traditionally, you don't actually recite these prayers on the same day, Tachanun and Halal. But I feel like actually it's an important time to bring all of our prayers together. The words are Avinu Malkeinu, our parent, the awesome part of divinity, majestic. Here, uh, grant us grace and hear us. Shekhinatenu, our intimate one, the imminent divine. Save us of spirit and of body. Avinu makenu Chaneinu vaneinu Shekhina tenu Hoshiana Avinu makenu shmakolenu Shema kolenu shekhinatenu Shekhinatenu Hatslichana Hatslichana This week, I had the honor of sitting in class with my teacher, Rav James Jacobson Maisels, as he taught with such grace and wisdom from his home, Achanaton, with his three children and wife in the north part of Israel. Gathered were a hundred people from around the world to sit with James. And so, as a teacher of contemplative Jewish practice, I uh, want to name my teacher and uh, teach in his honor. And as James said, I don't feel any, I don't have to do any specific practice right now. I'm just looking for things that give me a sense of respite and an opportunity to lean on something bigger than me. And so I thought when I was invited to come that that was my job as well, to offer you and those watching from home that. So let's take a moment together. And as I always invite people, if you can bring your feet to the ground, if they reach, please do so now. You don't have to have ever done meditation for this moment. You've got everything you need. So I also am gonna settle in. If you feel like closing your eyes and that's comfortable for you, great. If not, just let them settle on the ground in front of you. You could just notice that your feet are on the ground and that the ground is rising up to meet you. Let the weight be given over to the ground. Don't take my word for it. Check for yourself. Is the ground solid? And if so, can you let any more of what you're holding be dropped into the ground spread out through our beautiful earth, it can take it. And notice your seat, where you're seating, your seat on the seat. Can you let the weight of your pelvis and your spine and your head, torso, your arms, can that drop through your seat into the seat, which drops to the floor and into the earth? As we do this, we drop our roots into the ground. We are rooting into something larger than ourselves that can hold us, that does hold us. Now I'd invite you to notice that as it says in Breshit, the, the Torah portion, when we started the Torah again this week, and the divine just blew the breath of life into the first being. So notice that all this time you've been being breathed 
You didn't have to reach for it, God willing. So for a moment, just watch how the breath moves you. It take care, takes care of you in each and every breath. Can your shoulders soften? Can your jaw soften? Can the space between your eyebrows, the part that wants to figure everything out, can that for this moment just rest? Now I invite you to bring your palms as you're able to the center of your chest. If you're holding your phone and doom scrolling, you're going to have to put it down. <laughs> so what are we doing with our palms at our chest? We're actually just feeling the weight of our own touch, of our own companionship. We are not alone. We are filled with and surrounded by avatolam, an ever-present and infinite source of love, but we also have our own support here. So notice the rising and falling of your chest underneath your palms. The weight, the warmth perhaps of your hands. Breathing a deep breath in. Shoulders shrug and as you exhale, Let's do that again, breathing in together and letting the shoulders drop. <sighs> Maybe you express a little sigh. Letting your hands go, drop down to your legs once again, and letting your eyes drop open. A new prayer for this moment written by our teacher and dear friend, Dr. Melila Helner Eshed. El Elohei Haruchot Lechol Basar. God of the spirit of all flesh, here we are before you, broken spirits torn by grief. Chamona Aleinu, have mercy on us. Mortals created in your image, watch over us in a time of destruction and tragedy, terror, death, and panic. Please, please, Anna, may our compassion be revealed. I think I'll repeat that part. May our compassion be revealed. May the love within us overwhelm the harsh judgment, vengeance, and evil that is bruised within us. Behold, fierce, burning pain cries out, seeking revenge, not comfort. Watch over us, Shekhinah, our strength, over our scorched spirits, our terrified souls over our completely infuriated flesh. May the divine image rise shining like the dawn from our crushed hearts. May we have faith that we will merit to witness the goodness of the Holy One, the goodness of humankind in the land of the living. And together we say, Amen. Avi numa ke nu chane nu vane nu chane nu vane nu shechina te nu shechina te nu hoshiana. Hoshiana Avinu Makenu 
אבינו מלכנו, שמע קולנו. שמע קולנו, שכינתנו. שכינתי הצליחנה, הצליחנה. Thank you, Aviva. Th that was perfect. Just what we needed. <laughs> so even in our grief and our fear of what comes next, we must act. In a moment, we'll hear from some of our closest friends in Israel about what they're feeling and what they're doing. And one of our NIF friends who was able to join us. Uh, last week, Israeli civil society leaders, activists, and NGOs from all walks of Israeli life were defending their rights and equality from the judicial overhaul. It seems like years ago. <laughs> This week, these Israelis are now supporting the most vulnerable populations in the South and working hard to prevent another outbreak of Jewish-Arab violence like we saw inside Israel in May of 2021. In the coming weeks, these same incredible Israelis will begin piecing Israeli society back together and working to end this seemingly endless cycle of violence. This is the purpose of the New Israel Fund, to support them. We know that in times of crisis, issues of inequality within Israel do not simply go away and are in fact compounded. Our work continues even as we mourn and process these terrible events. That's why NIF launched our emergency safety net efforts that you'll hear about. Um, allow me now to share this personal message to us from NIF's international CEO, Daniel Sokach, to explain how NIF is responding on the ground in this moment. Hello, my friends. It's good to be with you at NIF Canada during these incredibly dark and difficult times. For me, and I'm sure for many of you, Uh, the New Israel Fund and our grantees and Shatil and the work that we're doing on the ground to try to repair what has been shattered, maintain bridges between Israel's diverse communities, and attend to the needs, the critical needs, of those suffering on the front lines of the catastrophic terror attacks uh, that Israel has experienced this past week. Uh, NIF has been a real light for me. Uh, and I want you to know that you all, the supporters and community of NIF around the world, uh, have been a real light to your brothers and sisters on the ground in Israel. They have told me this every day, that it sustains them to know that the international New Israel Fund community is right with them shoulder to shoulder. I know how terribly painful this period of time is for all of us. Uh, and for you in NIF Canada, It has a particular kind of pain because of our beloved Vivian Silver, uh, one of the great peace activists and just wonderful people who I've come to know over my 15 years at the New Israel Fund, uh, who of course is missing and assumed held captive in Gaza. We pray for her and her safe return and for the safe return and health of all of those who are held hostage uh, in Gaza right now, as well as for the healing and repair of all that has been shattered in Israel uh, with the communities that we serve and, and with all Israelis. I want to take a moment to tell you uh, what it is that NIF is doing now on the ground to respond to this catastrophic emergency. First of all, we are caring for the most vulnerable and those most affected by this nightmare. We're providing necessary shelter, food, and clothing to folks who have had to evacuate their kibbutzim near Gaza, and we are providing aid, both medical uh, and also uh, in terms of shelter, for Bedouin communities in the unrecognized villages near Gaza who have also suffered horribly over the past week. We are also working to prevent flare-ups of intercommunal violence. We all remember the horrible days of May 2021, 
when fighting broke out after a round of, of, of uh, battle of warfare between Gaza, uh, between Hamas and the IDF, uh, fighting spilled over into the mixed cities and neighborhoods in Israeli towns uh, across the country. And we are working hard with our partners in civil society and with those municipalities to build the kinds of systems that can prevent that kind of violence from reoccurring. We're also working with grantees like Fake Reporter to identify and deplatform the terrible spike in hate speech uh, that has occurred on social media over the past week, where extremists call for uh, people to take up arms against Arab citizens of Israel. And we are working hard to make sure that those kinds of sentiments are identified and removed when we can remove them from social media and from the internet. We are providing trauma counseling to civil society activists and to folks who are on the front line. Uh, these are often folks who have suffered horribly themselves. Uh, they have been besieged, they have lost loved ones, uh, they have loved ones who are missing, and they themselves are doing the work that I just described above in responding, and they need help and support, and we're providing uh, counseling for them. And finally, uh, at this terrible time, we know that, uh, that those who believe that uh, violence is the answer will always use these opportunities to try to provoke uh, inc and incite and cause all kinds of trouble uh, in Israel and on the West Bank. And so we are responding immediately to human and civil rights violations um, when tensions are very, very high. And we're working with our grantee partners to uh, identify and report and stop these kinds of violations from happening. Uh, and of course there, uh, the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, our flagship grantee, and our friends at Adala are running hotlines so that communities can report these kinds of outrages when they occur. At a time like this, I am sure you feel as I do, a sense of real uh, uh, despair and, and helplessness and hopelessness. And here I want to remind us all of, uh, of what Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel once said, which was that the Jews have no time for the luxury of despair. And truly, I want us to remember and to recognize that, uh, that what we are doing in supporting New Israel Fund at this moment is not only useful, we are being useful, it is of critical importance, again, to our brothers and sisters on the ground and to the values and the vision that we share. Uh, earlier today, one of our board members, Dr. Yasmin Abu Freha, a Bedouin woman, a doctor from the Negev, who uh, works at Soroka Hospital, the largest hospital in Israel South, who has been in the hospital tending to the, the horribly wounded and the dying since Saturday. She's been on call, working nonstop. Today, she described her experience at a webinar for the NIF community. And among the things that she said was that during this time, while she worked with doctors and nurses and paramedics and ambulance drivers from Jewish and Bedouin and Palestinian, Christian, Muslim and Jewish backgrounds to attend to kibbutznikim and soldiers and Bedouin and kids who had gone to the rave that weekend who were horribly injured. She saw at this moment of, of deepest darkness, a light, a light of hope. And for her, that hope was a realization that she knew who she was and on what side she stood. And this is what she said this morning. We are not talking about Israel versus Palestine. It is wrong to separate Israelis and Palestinians. The separation is between those who believe violence is the answer and those who do not. We at the New Israel Fund stand firmly with those who do not believe that violence is the answer. We stand with the peacemakers, the bridge builders, and the repairers of the breach. I want to thank all of you for your support, for your love of the New Israel Fund community in Israel. Uh, they know that you have their backs, and we are incredibly grateful for you. Thank you. I am humbled by the extraordinary generosity by so many of you in the past week. We've raised nearly $100,000 here in Canada in just days for emergency projects on the ground, just as, as Daniel just described. There's still a great deal we don't understand about what has happened and what will happen next. 
What progressive civil society leaders are feeling right now? What is happening on the ground? And more profoundly, what is the significance of this moment? What glimmers of hope can we possibly find over the past dark week and in the days to come? To moderate our panel, allow me to welcome our friend and respected journalist, Andrew Cohen, in order to introduce and guide our discussion. Um, brief introduction, Andrew Cohen is a best-selling writer, an award-winning journalist, and a professor of journalism, whom the New York Times called one of Canada's most distinguished authors. Uh, in a career of 45 years, he has written on politics and culture from both Ottawa, or sorry, from Ottawa, Toronto, London, Washington, Berlin. His seven books of history, biography, and commentary range in subjects from Canada's constitutional politics to national character to Arctic exploration. He writes a weekly column for Post Media News, appears regularly on radio and television, and is currently consulting producer on a television documentary on John F. Kennedy, which will air in November. Um, Andrew, I welcome you now to take over the podium. Thank you. And it's, um, it's lovely to be here in one sense, that we can all be together. It's not the program that we planned. Um, which seems a long time ago. We were then going to talk about Israeli democracy, and I think tonight we'll be talking about Israeli security. I am privileged to introduce the panelists from Israel who will um, guide us in this conversation. Um, two are online. We see, oh, I see them there. And one is here. And I want to welcome one to the stage, Amal, whom Thank I'll introduce. Amal, who is with me, Amal Orabi is a Palestinian lawyer and a human rights activist and a member of the board of directors of Amnesty International, Israel. Amal joined the New Israel Fund last year as the director of communications for Palestinian society in Israel. He has also worked at a private law firm in East Jerusalem specializing in planning and labor law. Amal is a prolific op-ed writer in Hebrew newspapers and records a legal a human rights podcast on Arab 48 website, which is the largest of its type in Israel. Uh, Amal has uh, a law degree from the University of Haifa and a master's degree in urban planning from Hebrew University. I'm delighted he is here with us, and he'll explain how we got here and uh, uh, in a, a moment. As well, um, Orly uh, Ezra Slikovsky holds a bachelor's degree uh, in law from Tel Aviv University. After interning at the Supreme Court, she got a master's degree in law with a focus on human rights law at Columbia University in New York. Orly is a member of the Bar Association of Israel. Um, she served as attorney uh, for uh, IRAC, which is the Israel Religious Action Center. It's devoted to uh, a just and egalitarian Israel. Um, since 2004, as director of the legal department from 2014 to 2021 and director since 2021. Uh, she has brought about significant legal achievements, such as making gender segregation on public transportation illegal, ending the orthodox monopoly on state-funded salaries to rabbis, filing and winning the first ever class action suit regarding exclusion of women, and disqualifies, disqualifying racist candidates from running for, Israeli, for Israel's parliament. And lastly, uh, Eret Nissan is an Israeli peace activist before joining... Um, uh, Mezakim, uh, which is a progressive digital uh, organization. He headed the Education and Advocacy Department of Peace Now. He holds a BA in Political Science and Philosophy from Ben Gurion University and an MA in Emergency and Disaster Management from Tel Aviv University. He is a certified dog trainer and volunteers as an emergency medical technician and an ambulance driver. So that is our panel. And thank you all for being here, both virtually. I know it's late in Israel, and um, we so appreciate that you're here. Um, we have with us, a, we, we will be um, talking for about 60 minutes, a conversation followed by 20 minutes of question and answer. We'll take questions, I think, from online as well as in this room, which, for those of you online should know, is absolutely full. And we weren't sure it would be, and it's a statement of solidarity and um, uh, 
concerned that we're all here together. Um, as a journalist, I, I, I'd like to ask you a journalist to question all of you. Um, where were you on Saturday morning last? Um, and what did you do? Why don't we begin here with Oran? <laughs> no. First of all, thank you for having me here. And thank you for uh, the NIFC, all the people that I met here, all the courage leaders that I met in during my traveling in, the, travel in, the, in Canada. The question, every one of us will remember the day that all this happened for long years. Uh, in that Saturday, I was with my wife. We was trying to travel and to, to have a quiet times without screen. So we were camping in a camping site and I woke up very early a very quiet morning, and after three, four hours, I start to see all the people, the people are packing and going. At 10 o'clock, I say to my wife, we have to open the phone. We are, we are alone in the camping site. We used to be with 40 families. There is something going on. So when we open the, open the, the phone and the screens, we re realize that our life will never look the same. So that's what <laughs> I did on that Saturday. Thank you. Um, Aran? So uh, good afternoon or good night here. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, we wish we could be there physically with you on the stage. So uh, last Saturday, like Kamal, I was with my wife camping in southern Israel. It uh, was for her birthday. And we woke up at 6.30 a.m. with sirens and large bangs. Uh, we were in Sdebukel, in the deep south of Israel. And we quickly understood something is happening. So we packed our things and we went to Be'er Sheva, where my wife's grandmother lived. And we got to her house and sirens were sounding all the time, large bangs, very, very scary. And between the sirens, uh, she got a phone call and we found out that my wife's cousin, who's an officer in the special forces, uh, was shot. He, he called his mother saying I was shot and I'm being taken to Soroka Hospital in Be'er Sheva. So I told them, you stay here, I'll go to the hospital and I'll find him. And while I was going to the hospital, again, sirens, I'm stopping my car, taking cover. And I get to the hospital. And as I got to the hospital, I saw a lot of soldiers and civilians and police officers uh, starting to flood the emergency room. And I'm an, emer I'm an ambulance driver. In my uh, training, I'm a medic. Uh, I always carry uh, gloves with me. So I put on my gloves and I helped carry the wounded inside the intensive care. And I stayed there for about four hours, helping to receive all the wounded. It was very, very traumatic. It was it was like in the movies that you see the, the textbook mass casualty event where there isn't one bed free and people just coming and coming. Children and young people from the party, uh, the rave in Reim, uh, Bedouin kids that were hurt by the rockets. Uh, it was very, very hard. And after four hours, when I understood that I can't help anymore, I went, I got out of the hospital filled with blood that wasn't mine. And uh, I went to my wife and I took a shower at her grandmother's house and then we went back to Tel Aviv. Um, so that was my Saturday. Orly. Hi, everyone. 
Um, I want to start actually the day before. I was also on vacation, <laughs> um, not in the north or the south. I was sort of in central Israel in a, a hotel called Shfaim, not far from Herzliya. I spent there a few days with my family, my my parents, my, my sisters, uh, my kids and my husband. And the day before Friday night, we held um, on the grass in, in Shfaim, um, a dinner for uh, the end of Sukkot for Simchat Torah. And we were 20 people and each one of us said, let's say what we are inviting to our homes, to our Sukkot this coming year. And we had this beautiful, you know, everybody, everybody said, you know, we want happiness and we want health. Um, and one of my relatives is a journalist. So she said, I want just boring news, not really, you know, outstanding news. Um, and it was very beautiful. And then we went to sleep um, and I woke up. Uh, someone knocked on my door at 8.30, actually my son. Um, I said, no, no, I want to sleep. Um, and, and I woke up and then we heard the news and two of my, my nephews were uh, drafted uh, to the army. Um, and we understood that uh, something um, terrible had happened. We um, we didn't have a siren. So Shfaim and, and in general, the Sharon area was one of the areas that did not have sirens that day. So we, we sort of debated whether we should go home. I live near Jerusalem. At the end, we decided we should go home. Um, and then I spent basically the whole afternoon waiting to donate blood alongside many, many, many other Israelis. So uh, after four and a half hours, I finally got um, uh, to give blood. I was actually supposed to fly to the States that same night, Saturday night. I was supposed to spend a week in New York and then to come for a week uh, uh, to Toronto. Um, it was clear quite quickly that the flight is not going to be, um, you know, I'm not going to fly because the flight is going to be canceled. Um, I was looking forward to actually coming to Canada because I was born in Canada um, and I haven't been for many, many years in Canada since 1986, so I was looking forward to it, but unfortunately, um, uh, we, we couldn't make it this time. Um, that That's my story of that day. Um, I think it took a while until the events unfolded and we really uh, started to realize the magnitude and the scope and the horrific and horrendous events that um, happened uh, that day. It was, we didn't understand it that same day. I mean, it was... Uh, it took us a while until we figured what actually happened. That's where I'd like to go from there. Uh, as you realized, all of you, the gravity of the events, the intensity, the horror, how are your organizations responding? I know. Maybe I will start before talking about my organization, I will start to talk about myself. So maybe before I came here, I was uh, a little bit worried of being the only Palestinian guy in the room. So as you say, I'm Amal. Amal is hope, and it's the most optimistic thing that you will hear uh, from me tonight. So, but now I believe that each one of you that decided to be here in these difficult circumstances is a exceptional, shows us exceptional re leadership and courage. I stand here with you with a lot of fear a fear that our lives wouldn't be the same. Fear for the safety of my family, my wife, my friends in Gaza, in Tel Aviv, in Haifa, in Jerusalem, and also in the Negev. It was a hard times, but I insisted to come here as a representative of an IF Israel. I insisted to come here for two reasons. The first of all is that in Israel today, there is no room for voices that seek to see the reality with open eyes, to acknowledge the occupation, and to refuse making the same mistake and expecting other results. These days, maybe it's, not, it's better to not to understand Hebrew, because all you will hear is a discourse of hate, revenge, and war. I came here in order to find a bit of a, a place, maybe to find a place for another discourse, for another conversation, for a difficult language, even. Have, the you, second, stopped, right. have you stopped reading uh, the Hebrew media in Israel? I stopped a year uh, since the last year. Oh. Last year, before this government was elected, I used to be uh, 
to take a part in a TV show, in a television show, in the public broadcasting, broadcasting in Hebrew. But when the Ministry of Communication took office, the first thing he did to eliminate all Palestinian voices. So today, the same minister proposed a bill that only can be described as a fascist. Any man or anyone would talk or maybe propose another discourse, he would be in a jail. While I'm sitting with you here, two of my friends, one of them have a PhD in public, in, in, in political science, is in jail because he wrote an article about what's happening now, because he shows empathy for the people in Gaza, because he says that we don't accept any kind of collective punishment. So he's in jail. So only you can imagine, imagine what will happen when I go home. And that's my biggest fear. And about what we did as an organization, it's hard to say that what's happened surprises us. The question for us wasn't if, it was when. We didn't expect this kind of mortality. We didn't expect this kind of, of, of horrible things that happened. But we knew that the question is, is when, not if. So we start acting since the, the, beginning, the beginning of the year. We start to establish an infrastructure for the civic society in order to keep them work under these horrible consequence, consequences, in order to train them, to support them, to give them the ground that they can work together they can capitalize their impact and they can also get at the proper and the maximum protection that they would need. Because we knew that in this emergency situation, nobody will be safe, especially people like me, like Iran and like Orly, that we are insist that there is a partner for peace. And we have to look to the reality with open eyes. We have to look to the occupation with open eyes. And we have not to forget the people, the innocent people in Gaza, in the biggest open prison air in the world. They are starving now without electricity, without water. That's not what we want. And that not, is not the solution. So, so can we? Can we get to the uh, ask the other yeah, panelists what, uh, how they're I would have Because the others give you uh, a, a more deeper understanding right. about what's happening. We'll return to some of your points. Thank um, you. Iran. So uh, if uh, Amal uh, took the liberty before he answers the question to talk a little bit about himself. Um, so I'm a peace activist in my political motivation. I worked for Peace Now. Uh, this is why I get up in the morning. I'm dealing with a lot of struggles and a lot of initiatives and a lot of uh, issues, but the reconciliation and transitional justice and fighting the occupation is what we call the co-resistance, Israelis and Palestinians who share the same space to fight against oppression, discrimination, racism, and to promote equality and democracy and peace. So this is where I'm coming from. So every time there is a flare up of violence, this is where my, my fears lie before, because I know it's a setback in both societies that will drive more anger and more animosity and more mistrust. And I'm a peace activist because of my military service. I was a combat soldier in the special forces in the canine unit. And because I'm in the WhatsApp groups with all of my Comrades, they were drafted and everything started mobilizing toward there. I'm the youngest brother of, we are three brothers. All of us were combat soldiers. They're starting talking about being called for reserves. So I have my personal anxiety that the people around me are mobilizing to go into harm's way. My political um, motivations that is being threatened. This is my, my goal. This is the thing to end the occupation, to reduce violence. But also I'm the executive director of an organization. So Mechazkim is a progressive digital movement. Our expertise is social media. And we, from the first couple of hours, we understood that we have a role to play about how to frame the events. 
what narratives are, are taking place. And especially as the hours went by and we, we understood the magnitude of this horrible disaster that happened, the crime against humanity, the brutality, the, the fact that all of us in the Mechazkin team and everyone I know have people that they know and love that either have been murdered or taken hostage or wounded or drafted. So all of our relatives and friends and acquaintances and colleagues are either in one of these four categories or know someone that in these four categories. So in the days since last Saturday, we identified the main narratives or meta narratives that we need to push through our social media platforms. We run the biggest social media operation in the liberal democratic camp. We're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and Telegram and WhatsApp. And we understood that right now, the, the first days are a crucial time where the villains and the heroes are being chosen. So I'll give only one narrative. We understood that the, the what we call the poison machine of Netanyahu and the right wing, the, the, the Jewish supremacists in Israel, they took this opportunity in order to frame what is happening right now as a struggle between Jews and Arabs or between Israelis and Palestinians. And we understood that we need to create a counter narrative. So in the past week, we have been highlighting stories and pushing it to millions of Israelis through various social media platforms about this shared experience about stories of heroism of Bedouin uh, uh, truck drivers that drove into uh, Hamas militants um, fire to save Israeli Jews, about paramedics and medics in the Negev that are fighting to save lives under fire, the unrecognized communities in the Negev that they don't even have a shelter nor to talk about a siren, these stories. And the stories about the people of Umel Fahem and Kfar Qasem and Jaffa and Haifa that have been recruiting and opening their house to the refugees from uh, the communities near the Gaza border who had to flee, fled their home. So this is about a, a joint experience, a horrible experience of, it's not about Israelis against Palestinians or Jews versus Arabs, but fundamentalists and people that understand that they believe in violence against us, the people who believe in, in life, in equality, and the understanding that, that the two people belong in this land and our future is together. So this is one narrative and I can, I can elaborate more about the different narratives, but this is the role that we are taking right so, now. So Iran, how are you overwhelmed in trying to get that message out or do you feel it is gaining purchase, it is being effective? So it's difficult because this is not a popular time to talk about a shared society or to talk about empathy. It's dangerous uh, even to talk about this now. Yes. It's more dangerous for Palestinian citizens of Israel, yes. Uh, and civil society organizations have been under attack. You mentioned uh, Vivian Silver from Women Wage Peace and, and other organizations. The amount of hatred and incitement that we see from Israeli Jews against human rights activists, peace activists, even those that have been targeted, taken hostage is horrific. Um, what we are trying to do, and I can say that in my team, we are partially functioning because we have loved ones that are being affected. We applied for an emergency grant and it was approved right away from the New Israel Fund so we can have the means and resources to boost our capacity in order to tackle the, the challenges that we have right now. And some of the narratives that we're trying to push, they gain more traction those that are pointing the finger at the government. Some of them are more challenging, like telling the shared experience of Jews and Arabs in this crucial time. Right. Um, Orly, do you want to respond to that and also tell us what um, IRAC, your organization, um, is doing, has yeah. been doing? Yeah, so uh, IRAC, the Israel Religious Action Center, is the legal and public advocacy arm of the reform movement in Israel. And I want to talk a little bit about what the Reform Movement is doing it because we are a congregational organization spread all around Israel, 
including uh, around uh, the, the Gaza area uh, and southern Israel of the Negev. Uh, we have a congregation in Shar Negev, which was very, very uh, severely uh, hit. And what we did in the last week is, first of all, helping uh, the people who were evacuated there and all the others who were evacuated from the south uh, through our humanitarian relief fund. We have a relief fund called Keren Bechavod, uh, and uh, we have uh, offered assistance to families uh, who are located in Elat and in the Dead Sea and in Jerusalem area and in many other places, including Shfaim, the place uh, I, I uh, mentioned before, uh, assisting them with uh, food um, and uh, clothing and toys um, uh, all over the place, helping children at risk um, uh, go from you know uh, places like, like Ashkelon or Ashdod in the south to safer uh, places, helping uh, um, uh, uh, populations like the um, uh, Bedouins in the Arakugas villages, also with uh, um, anything, any products, any supplies that could help them. Uh, we've also had a lot of work with uh, pastoral care, um, basically offering uh, our rabbis to assist uh, people who are uh, in extreme distress um, uh, naturally. Um, so we have a lot of uh, our rabbis, uh, mostly the rabbi who is the congregational rabbi in Shara Negev, but other rabbis as well, uh, going around uh, visiting families, um, the grieving families and, and wounded families and many, many others. I can just give you an example that today, uh, the rabbi of uh, Shara Negev uh, attended seven funerals. So you can just imagine the magnitude uh, and the scope. Um, and it's, it's really just the beginning. Uh, this past Shabbat, we had Shabbat services for people who were evacuated and displaced. And those were very moving. I just saw a, a piece of what two of our rabbis saying, we shall overcome uh, in front of dozens of, of people who were evacuated from the South. So very moving and, and I think important. Um, uh, and we are also very busy in uh, helping the helpers, uh, helping our rabbis, because it's again, because of the magnitude and the scope of those uh, uh, atrocities, this is something that is, is really unprecedented. So really helping them and giving them the tools to treat, treat others. And we are also very um, uh, conscious about thinking about our staff, um, how they are uh, coping with, uh, with this, talking about the experience. We've had webinars um, to our congregants in Israel and also to many uh, Reformed Jews outside of Israel, um, offering them our uh, take on the issue and um, talking to them a little bit about that. Um, specifically about, the, about Iraq, we are now very concerned uh, as mentioned before, by the rising racism um, and violence. We've been fighting racism for many, many years. We've also cooperated with Iran in Mechazkim, um, and we've done a lot of issues in fighting racism. And in this uh, circumstances, unfortunately, we already see a rise in violence um, toward, uh, toward Arabs or Palestinians, uh, mostly in East Jerusalem, and of course in the territories. So this is something we have been uh, focusing on so in the last uh, few days. Um, the issue uh, was mentioned, the issue of the uh, lack of shelters of the Bedouins in the unrecognized villages. We are uh, writing uh, actually the, the today um, demanding shelters uh, for the Bedouin uh, villages. Um, and we've also, we've done a lot of uh, uh, monitoring uh, on the budget for the past uh, few months. Um, and now again, because there is a need, um, a large need of uh, um, transferring budgets to the people in need, uh, we are also monitoring the fact to make sure that they're taking from maybe other um, goals which are not as necessary, the coalition uh, uh, money, which has been um, targeted to uh, a lot of um, goals such as ultra-Orthodox schools, which do not teach the core curriculum. Um, so it's really demanding to de uh, reprioritize uh, the budget. So that's another thing. And another goal is uh, making sure that different emergency services would uh, operate on Shabbat. We saw during the last weekend that there was a, a big uh, fuss at the end. El Al did fly uh, Israelis and um, a lot of supplies uh, in Israel during Shabbat. But there were a lot of uh, other um, discussions and debates about these issues. So we have to make sure that uh, the next Shabbat this is going to uh, to happen because, of course, it's an emergency uh, like never never before. Uh, so that's, I think, uh, most of the things. Is, that, is, uh, uh, we've heard from Orion about the reaction to what he's been doing. Are, uh, what is the reaction to the kind of work you're doing? Um, has it been appreciated or is there hostility because of 
how you see things? I, I think that in most cases it has been welcomed uh, by the people that we, we offer to him. I, I can tell you that I went today to a, a sort of a vigil uh, calling to, for the release of the hostages. Um, and people shouted at us. Uh, there was actually violence against a few uh, such vigils in the last few days uh, by right wings who, uh, and who, who could, you know, oppose asking the hostage to be released. But some people, uh, you know, treat this as anti-government and anti-Netanyahu, and therefore uh, there were violence uh, opposition toward toward those uh, protests. So that I would say something that I encountered opposition. I think the other, um, we'll probably talk about it later, I think a lot of Israelis um, um, went and uh, wanted to assist and help as much as possible to the people evacuated. Um, and in this regard, I think we have a very large group of Israelis who support those efforts. Okay. Amal, did you want to respond to those I comments? would happy to say that I agree with Iran that uh, some people, some groups that they are already trying to expel it the situation and to take advantage on the people suffering and uh, take advantage on the people that were killing in the innocent people in or in in both sides in order to convince us maybe two things that is, uh, uh, when I watch the news I read I see two things that they want to convince us the first one that there is and maybe there it's my, their biggest goal that there is no differences between Arabs. And all of them, their priority in life, their meaning of life, it's to kill a Jews. They want to convince us that if you, if you sympathize or empathize with be, the people in Gaza, you are supporting terror. If you are criticizing the politics of Israel, you are anti-Semitic. And if you are a Jewish that don't accept the Israeli policies in the West Bank and the occupied territories. You're the self-hater self -hater Jews. So they self-hater. So they trying to take advantage right now. And if we don't keep this conversation, if we don't is insist in, in to, to, to uphold and to stand strong in the humanitarian principles, in the justice principles, they will win. I want to remind you that Bengvir gained his political power after the events of May 21 because he, he. You're talking about the Israeli Minister of Public Security. Yeah, Minister it's a wi white Min supremacist. You can't say it, a white yeah. supremacist. This party, the, 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 political, the, 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 the political project for them is the apartheid. And the judicial overhaul was one of the purpose of the judicial overhaul is to implement the, the, full, the full apartheid. And my biggest fear that the people that will, will take advantage in this horrific times in order to continue what they are doing. So if we don't stand strong, we don't speak truth to power, we don't speak about the international law, about the, in, the innocent people, about the principle of justice, they will win at first. Because of that, I'm here and I'm happy to be with this amount of people that they reject to be a part of this discourse, of hate discourse, of revenge discourse, of war discourse that, that's happening right now. So, <laughs> so we, we've been talking about what happened directly after uh, uh, Saturday, and we're now eight days away from what happened. Israel is still counting and burying dead. You already referred to seven funerals. Um, there will be more, presumably. And at this moment, at, at, at this hour, uh, uh, Israel is massing troops on the, on, in the south. There, there is every expectation that uh, the IDF will enter uh, uh, um, Gaza. And only we can think what will happen. So where does this leave? We, are, we will be pivoting, I think, to a new stage. Um, where will this leave all of you and what you do and your work? Uh, let's begin with Iran. So, first of all, we need to remember that the policies of Netanyahu in the past 15 years, almost consecutive uh, reign or regime, was to separate the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Hamas in Gaza, and to strengthen Hamas, and to undermine the moderate leadership uh, that 
is the legitimate uh, uh, leadership that is calling for diplomatic, nonviolent, uh, peaceful negotiations. We have seen there is a quote by Netanyahu from 2019 saying, maintaining the separation between Hamas and Gaza and the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank is what helps us to prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state. There is a quote from Bezalel Smotrich, another Jewish supremacist, now the Secretary of Treasury, saying Hamas is an asset and the Palestinian Authority is a liability from 2015. The policies of managing the conflict or shrinking the conflict has crushed or broke on, on the rocks of reality. What we are looking right now is mass mobilization of military forces into Gaza. There's going to be a ground invasion. There's going to be a deteriorating um, uh, violation of humanitarian law and international law. We already have seen the Israeli government cuts off water, electricity, uh, gasoline to Gaza, trying to pressure the 2 million Gazans, Palestinians that live there. Uh, we already tried this. Right now, our priority in Mechazkim is to call for a de-escalation of the situation and the uh, return of hostages. This should be the priority, the ethos of the of the state of Israel is that we will do anything to bring one of us that has been captivated or or taken hostage. What we are going to see is a lot of destruction. We might see a second front with Hezbollah in Lebanon. What I can say is that I think there is an international consensus that Hamas crossed a very very uh, clear line. It was before last Saturday, it was a terror organization that targeted civilian population, but the atrocities committed by Hamas uh, last Saturday must uh, um, create an international response. What we know right now is that the Israeli government is either unable or unwilling or incapable of thinking rationally. We have a bunch of pyromaniacs corrupted, illegitimate, that are riding on the sentiment of fear and revenge in order to promote their political goals. We have seen voices from the settler right wing saying we need to uh, conquer or liberate the Gaza Strip to expel the Palestinian population and to rebuild settlements and Israeli cities inside the Gaza Strip. We have seen calling for um, mass atrocities, genocide, ethnic cleansing, um, the, to commit uh, uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity, people tweeting on Twitter. Uh, this is the level of discourse we have right now. Have you seen that? Um, have you seen statements in from the Israeli, uh, uh, from people in the Knesset saying that, or people part of the ruling uh, coalition? Last that? week there was. Last week, there was a letter signed by 20 coalition members, uh, some of them from the Likud party, calling for Netanyahu and the government to set political goals uh, and first and foremost to um, um, eradicate Hamas and to regain full sovereignty on the Gaza Strip and to uh, uh, impose full Israeli sovereignty on the Gaza Strip. And they're looking to gain more support. This is not a bottom-up uh, fantasy. This is a top-down fantasy. Um, now, the voices of reason, the voices of core resistance, the uh, voices of human rights and international law needs to speak up. We need your help and your support. We need your pressure on your government to take action. The Canadian government has relationship with the Lebanese government. There are Canadian citizens being uh, taken hostage by Hamas. You have a role to play, not just as supporters of the new Israel Fund, but also as citizens of Canada. This is a humanitarian and geopolitical international crisis, and we need right now for you to speak up because we need your help to help us speak up right now. Well, thank you for that, and we're, thank you for that. Um, I, 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 I was going to ask you all uh, towards the end of this what you think we should do. 
So we will return to that subject. I but have more. I have I'm more sure you do. You can do. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Uh, I'd like to get Orly, Orly's view on this. Yeah, I think it's important to um, to talk about the current feeling in Israel. I think the, the strongest sense, other than pain and fear, um, um, is really uh, a sense of abandonment. People feel they have been abandoned by the government and by the state. They have been left alone um, and left, you know, to to die and to uh, kidnapped, uh, taken hostage, uh, and and so many people have been wounded. And and not only during the horrific events, but as they unfolded and during the last week, the feeling was that no. Uh, state system is fun functioning. Basically, we have a system that does not function at all. And it's clear that it's the direct result of the fact that this government has really brought incompetent people to any post possible. And, it and it's taken its toll over this past year. Um, not only talking about, you know, of course, the, um, um, the, the, divi the divisiveness inside Israeli society, but in general, the fact that the, the different government ministries are not operating or not functioning. And we, we, we saw this in the last few days. Maybe now, today, uh, there have been a little bit uh, change, but the welfare system, I mean, the health system, thank God, uh, did operate, but the welfare system, the Ministry of Interior, everything did not uh, function at all. Um, and in, into this vacuum, uh, we had you know the civil society organizations really step in like never before and it's such an, an inspiring and amazing move but we have to first think about the fact how how could have this happened that nothing worked like it should have uh, it should have worked you know not talking about you no know, intelligence and uh, the idf didn't come on time and then during the whole uh, uh, event and, and later so i think people were really felt abandoned and this was uh, that's a very strong feeling that people just lost any confidence uh, in the state and i think this is a feeling shared not only by people who oppose this government but also people who support this coalition and according to polls we see that uh, i think just a couple of days ago 56 percent of israelis uh, think that netanyahu should resign uh, including people from the coalition so it's clear that a lot of people that up until now said, well, we, you know, we might uh, not really like the legal coup, but we are for Netanyahu. Now maybe there is this shift. And in this sense, it could be a seismic shift that could uh, affect dramatically uh, Israel's politics um, uh, for years to come. It remains to be seen, but I think that's a very very strong sense. Of course, the other sense is a sense of fear um, about what's going to evolve now. Uh, with the war in Gaza, uh, a possible war uh, up north. Um, I think people are very much uh, um, scared and afraid. Of course, we are uh, very concerned by the, um, what's going on now in Gaza, by the uh, lives being taken uh, there. Um, and as I said, the fear that, again, it might, uh, the rise of racism and we might uh, have another um, cycle of the events that have been um, that occurred in 2021. And this is, of course, something that we are very much uh, concerned about and uh, should should work uh, to prevent. Uh, the fact that now we have um, um, guns in the coalition and Eisenkot is, is good news. Um, according to the coalition, new coalition agreement for the emergency government, there is a committee uh, which is in charge of the police and is in charge on what's happening in mixed cities. So that means that Bengvir uh, who is a very, very dangerous person who could not be accounted uh, at all, uh, is not uh, responsible for that um, for now. So he has someone above him uh, in charge, and that's good news. So in this sense, we are in a better situation, at least in this respect, since 2021, um, uh, since, uh, not 2021, since uh, that situation that was here just until a couple of weeks ago. So in this sense, we hope that, you know, it was would not evolve again, to horrific uh, events within uh, Israeli mixed cities. Um, uh, Orla, you mentioned the national unity um, uh, um, government. Does that give Netanyahu cover? I mean, uh, we've heard reports of his po unpopularity, the unpopularity of the regime, but does that give him cover now for as long as he needs it? Before well, the course, inquiry, that, before that, there's an inquiry and we hear what really right. happens. So, so, so that, that's the risk, uh, but I think uh, the risk was too high uh, in order for, you know, to prevent uh, two more responsible uh, politicians to enter into the government. Uh, so I think that was, uh, that is something that is 
better now than before. I think the government that was uh, in power for the last 10 months was, uh, um, you know, needless to say, the, the, the most horrible and dangerous government Israel has ever had. Um, and we see now the results of what the gov this government has been doing for all this month. You know, I think the protest movements for many, many months kept saying, this is dangerous to Israel, and we're going to see these implications. And unfortunately, we saw it, you know, I think weaker than we than all of us thought. So it's a direct result of this government. So in this sense, I think, I think it's a good thing that you enter into, into the government. Um, I don't think Netanyahu is going to get off the hook so quickly. Uh, I think the price is so high and the trauma is so deep that he's uh, going to pay the price and uh, you know maybe uh, we would be able to have this political change that we should have uh, had uh, years ago. So I'll, I'll, before we get to that. No, I, uh, let me okay. be less optimistic about the, the new government because this is not an emergency government. It's a war government. Benny Gantz and these people joined this government not to order to offer us alternative, not to over, in order to give us another path. They came to this government because they do, they want to do what they know to do, war. There are two generals, three generals, and generals can't offer us any solution. And I want to connect to Iran's, uh, what Iran says. Netanyahu's and the right government, and even their partner, new partner now, they try to convince us over the two decades now, and from, from the second intifada, they try to convince us in two things, that there is no partner for peace, and it's not, we, we, yani it's not worth it to, to invest any uh, effort in this because it's don't, it won't be any, uh, any peace or any partner. The second thing, that they, we can manage the conflict. We can manage the conflict without paying any price. We can keep six million people under incubation without rights and not to pay any price and we can continue to do any, we can continue to do agreements with other authoritarian uh, Arabian countries in the, uh, in the Middle East that they don't care about the Palestinians. So we are now innocent people paying the, the price of this prescription of this assumption. I'm proud to, be, uh, proud to be part of the NIF that we never accept this, uh, this assumption. We always worked for building a partnership, for uh, offering another, uh, an alternative. So now innocent people are paying the price and if we not start, we'll not, would not start talking about an alternative, I don't trust this guy in the, guys in the, in the government. I don't trust this emergency government. It's a war government. So practically speaking, the, uh, that uh, generals, the, some of the progressive forces have joined this government will not, mod what you're saying is it will not moderate policy. That it will, uh, that if Israel is prepared to go into Gaza, the national unity government will give it cover to do that, is what you're saying, and I don't yeah, know if, you know if what Orly and Iran uh, you, you agree. You know what will de-escalate the situation? The strong civic society. We are seeing now that whereas the both Arab and Jewish, both Palestinian and Israeli leadership were failed, the civic society is succeeded, succeeding in maintaining uh, people resilience mean, and keeping the, the order and keeping the mixed city not to be escalated like we said. We don't see another escalation inside Israel and inside the mixed cities, not because Gantz joined the government, because those brief guys and other hundreds of guys of strong leaders are working now in the ground in order to keep the resilience of the people, to support them emotionally and, uh, and give them the proper, uh, uh, the proper uh, th th give them their needs. So we should support those people, so th support the civic society, the human rights organization, the uh, human rights defenders, and not now to start to clap hands for the new, right. the new okay. government. Um, could, you, could Orly and um, Iran speak to that point directly? So Gantz and Eisenkot did not join the coalition to moderate it. It's not going to be a more moderate uh, government. They, as I see it, they see their their role as how to um, manage this war in a 
um, rational and responsible way. But there's a flaw in this uh, plan or this uh, rationale, because right now the government has only set military goals to the war. And you can't go on on a military uh, adventure that for sure will cause unimaginable destruction of Gaza, innumerable deaths of Palestinians and Israelis without thinking about the day after. And unfortunately, Gantz and Eisenkot, neither of them are thinking about the day after, saying we need international forces, we need the return of the, the Palestinian Authority to the Gaza Strip. Any try to isolate and undermine Hamas in an international way, with legal action, with economic sanctions, no strategic, um, reasonable, long-term strategy has been presented to the Israeli public. They're not taking questions from the media. And as Amar said, the only beacon of hope right now is civil society. And you can't uh, disconnect the judicial overhaul in the past year from what's happening right now. Because the same people and organizations that for the past 10 months have been called traitors and anarchists and um, anti-patriotic and cowards now are the people that are leading the attempts to hold Israel together and hold Israel intact. The same people that were seen as enemies of the state are now on the front line defending Israel, not just militaristically, but also in the mixed cities, keeping the peace, keeping the order, standing in solidarity where everything else collapsed because of the, 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 the bullies and, and, and underqualified people we have leading this country right now. Orly? Yeah, I, yeah I, I completely agree that uh, having Gantz and Eisenkot in the government does not make it um, um, a perfect government. It's very, very, very far from it. But I still think it's less uh, problematic or less, um, ex less extremist than a government which is ruled by uh, uh, Ben Gvir and Smotrich and Netanyahu. Um, I think we should be fair um, and talk about we are now in a deadlock and the deadlock is uh, of course going uh, into a war is a very problematic uh, issue that will have a very high toll and it's an I completely agree with uh, with Iran and, and Amal that we the government does not present any long-term vision to solve the conflict and just try to manage it that's completely true on the other hand we have to understand that now uh, if uh, there would not be um, a drastic measure toward Hamas, uh, Israelis would not go back to live um, in the uh, Gaza envelope in the in the south. There would not be anybody. And people kept saying it. People who were uh, who were you know under the terror uh, last Shabbat kept saying we are not going to be able to go and sleep there with our kids uh, under the circumstances. So it cannot be the same as was you know you know a couple of years ago um in um 2014 and and before so it's clear that something else needs to be done in order to eradicate hamas um of course the 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 price is, is terrible um and we we you know i think nobody presents the israeli public uh, with a you know an alternative or a solution or under, explaining this is one measure, and then we have to think of a long term. It's like a step in the long, you know, vision that we offer Israeli public. This has not been done at all, and this is, of course, um, very, very problematic. So we we brought you, if uh, flowing from what you've just said, we brought you here to talk about democracy originally, and we were going to talk with a lot of moral clarity, I thought, about the overhaul of the Supreme Court. Is that effectively, that discussion effectively dead now, for at least for the foreseeable future? Let me say well. something about that. Because this thing gave me hope, a little bit of hope. Because in the past six months, we saw that in the Israeli society, there is a massive collective that seek for liberal life that want to stand on the justice principles. And they want a better future. They want to protect minorities, to protect the, the Supreme Court, and to build another future. Now, it's the big exam for those people to ask themselves themself a simple question. If they believe that all humans were born, were, were born equal, 
because this question is not related only for the Palestinian or the Palestinian ch children in Gaza. It's related for all of us. And now the time to speak up. Now the time, the, the example the exam of this collective. So I hope that this, that what we saw in the last six months and the NIFC supported the demonstration and we supported also the non-popular voices, the voices that want to look to the reality with open eyes, to look to the occupation with, with open eyes. I hope that those voices and those collective will stay strong, especially in the next step, in, in, the, next, in the next time, in order to build another reality, a, a build another future and to build a partnership. So I, the, the, I hope that they will stay, they will stay strong. Because if not, the voices that Iran told us about will win. The people that want to convince us that there is no solution, we have to conquer Gaza, and we have to be afraid and uh, careful from any Palestinian or Arab in, uh, in the area. Okay. Iran? Um, Orly, you wanted to comment before and then? All right. Yeah, uh, well. You know, we have been dealing uh, very intensively with uh, legal coup and with the pro-democracy uh, protest, uh, really uh, joining the protest from the very beginning for the past 40 weeks. Um, and it seems that for now, uh, the, the legal coup is not going to be uh, pushed uh, forward anymore. Um, that seems like the, the um, obvious, obvious result. Um, and I think, the, like Amal said, I think the, the positive result of uh, the, the past uh, nine or ten months is really that the Israeli public opened uh, their eyes, uh, both in the sense to understand the importance of democracy and what democracy really is. It's not just, you know, uh, having a rule of the majority. It's really caring for human rights, for different groups of society, because any one of us could be a minority in need for the protection of the Supreme Court. Also understanding the need to change the current situation, to have a real constitution that would really protect us so we would not be in this situation again, you know, in a few months or a few years' time. And actually, in the last few weeks, uh, we also saw people opening their eyes to the what does it mean to have a Jewish identity um, of the state of Israel? Uh, what kind of Judaism we want? We saw it around Yom Kippur and the whole issue of segregation uh, in the public sphere. So I think this was also a very important process for Israelis to understand there is more than one way to be Jewish. We can be both uh, pluralistic uh, and Jewish at the same time. And th those have been positive results that uh, I hope would bring a positive change in uh, bringing a real constitution that would safeguard uh, our rights more than it has uh, done today. I, I don't believe that um, the current government would be able to uh, push forward with a legal coup, and that's, of course, a very positive result. Yes. Iran? So, first of all, we need to recognize that we can't overstate the gravity of the crisis right now. What happened last Saturday and what is still happening, uh, the comparisons for were for like to 9-11 and to Pearl Harbor. This is worst in many respects. Last Saturday, it was the, mo the, the, the day where the highest number of Jews were murdered in one day since the Holocaust. The collective trauma of the Jewish people in general, but also for the, the Jewish citizens of Israel, the collective trauma, the, our collective psyche is grounded in fear of the memories of pogroms and the Holocaust, but also the surprise of the 73 war, the Yom Kippur war. And just uh, last May, uh, Israel celebrated its 75th uh, um, Independence Day. And there was a survey about what was the worst day, what was the worst crisis. And, and it was uh, neck to neck, the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin and the, the Yom Kippur War. And when you take the collective trauma of the Holocaust and you take the collective trauma and the collective memory of betrayal uh, between the citizens and the government of the 1973 war, and you see the 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 footage of Holocaust survivors being taken hostage into Gaza, this is something that is, that is breaking us. 
So I think the judicial overhaul is dead. I think that a lot of things that we thought were true or important are no longer relevant. I think that the leadership, the parties, a lot of, th a lot of things broke down last Saturday. But, and I will pivot into a more optimistic uh, a conclusion because I, I, I look, I'm looking forward to, to the questions. After 1973, the government changed and there was an historic peace treaty with Egypt. It was the first time Israel turned an enemy into an ally. And if all of us will walk, would, would have walked in a time machine and go back to 1975, only two years after the 1973 Yom Kippur War, and we would ask someone in the streets of Tel Aviv or Haifa or Jerusalem, what do you think would be our relationship with Egypt 10 years from now, meaning 1985, we would hear people say, there is no chance of peace. We don't have a partner to talk. We just fought with them in 1948, in 1956, in 1967, and just 1973, two years ago. In average, every eight years, the entire adult population of Israel dropped everything they were doing. They wore uniform, they took guns, and they went and fought Egyptians. And then three years later, uh, Sadat is speaking in the Knesset. One year later, we have a peace treaty. So reality has... Uh, tendency to surprise us, but we need to be very clear about the future that we want because we can create the narratives, we can support the voices, we have a responsibility and commitment to help write the new story of Israel out of this pain, out of this broken uh, uh, crisis that we have right now. Um, thank you, Aran. Those were very moving and inspiring words. We have just about, just a few minutes before we're gonna go to questions. Um, I'd like to ask each of you and ask you to keep your answers short about what you think we here can do at this moment. Um, Iran had talked about it, but I'm gonna begin with Amal, and if you could keep your answers short because we would like to go to questions. Yeah, first of all, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for this conversation. I think that we have to insist to continue this conversation and never stop it. And the another thing that what we are uh, experiencing today is not only a failure of the Palestinian and the Israeli, it's the failure of the whole international community that for decades they neglected, neglected the area, they ignored the Palestinian suffering, they ignored the maybe the worst conflict in the modern history, and now is the time. It's the time to put pressure in the governments, it's time to put pressure in the diplomats, in the civic society, and the, the, op the, the, the public opinion, in order to say, never again. We don't want to use the same mistakes and to do the same mistake and ex expect another result. So what I'm really expecting is, and hoping, is to see a big demonstrations in the streets, putting in pressure in all the, the countries because there is no rational voices in Israel. And if there is no rational voices in Israel and in Palestine, maybe here we can find one and we, here we can change the, the reality. So putting pressure, supporting human rights uh, uh, defenders and the human rights organization and the civic society and to be optimistic the last thing, I, I really understand that a lot, of, a lot of the people here and back home feeling fear and feeling anger. These feelings can be fastly transformed to a revenge or a, de a avenge. We must don't fall in this hole and to start a new generation where none of the Palestinian children all the Israeli children have to live in this reality. Thank you, Amal. Thank you, Amal. There, there is a reason your name means hope. <laughs> um, Orly, uh, if you don't mind, and, and Mal, uh, uh, Aran, a, a quick uh, uh, analysis of what we can do. 
Yeah, I, I, you know, I think in this really dark period, um, I think two things give me hope, talking about Amal. Uh, first of all, we mentioned it, the, the um, willingness of so many Israelis to volunteer and to lend a hand is really tremendous. I mean, we spoke about it very briefly and everybody talks about it, but it's important to state uh, it's not obvious. It's not something that people have expected for, uh, and it does build on the protest movement, which is amazing. But still, it's it doesn't stop to amaze me to see the amount of people uh, and the amount of you know any everything they're willing to do just to help so many people um, around them, people they don't know, um, just to give a hand. So that's one thing, really, a ray of light uh, in this darkness. And the other thing that gives me hope is really the amount of support uh, that we hear and get from Jews from all over the world. I mean, the amount of people who have called me and written to me um, and asked me and told me they're just thinking about us, thinking about you know the staff, thinking about what we're doing, how we are important for them, how they care about us, what whatever they can do to help us. Um, and just even this moral support is so important in this really abyss that we are in. Uh, and it's really such a sense of despair that all of those, um, uh, you know, just uh, saying hi and, and saying we are here for you is tremendously important. And the other thing is, of course, supporting, supporting uh, the people on the ground, supporting the human rights organizations, supporting the civil society that is doing so much and is will, will continue to do so much. Uh, with the help of really people um, like you, like NIF, and from people from all over the world, is tremendously important. Um, and I want to echo Iran in saying that we are in a very, very, very difficult point, but you know we, we will be able to overcome it uh, together. We need to uh, look clearly ahead um, and to make sure we are going to continue to fight for justice and equality for everyone uh, here in the region. And I think out of respect for the audience, I think uh, let's go to the questions. Okay. I'll take a time after to okay. do some call to air. All right. Um, where's Ben? Who is... Uh, oh, you're passing the microphone around? Um, okay, go ahead. I think the, you need the microphone, though, so that has to come to you before the question is asked. But I will say as someone on Zoom, we need to also respect the people on Zoom asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Edna Magder. I've been a member of uh, NIF Canada from the, from the beginning, and we've been donors. So you can, uh, at least you know where I come from. What has been troubling, and my question is to you, Amal. Uh, I've been advocating for what NIF stands for for many years, spent the rest of this week doing that. But I'm also we have read and studied very hard the manifest of Hamas. And I'm not hopeful. I am very, very, I despair uh, of oh, trying to have oh. Hamas as a partner. Uh, I, read, I read it, and I'm sure you have too. I don't know how many people in the audience have read that, but I recommend that you read it. This is not a partner, this, they say very clearly, we are out to kill every Israeli we can. Please, uh, talk to me about that. How do we work this out? Yeah. I, I, we're gonna take, uh, I, I, my instructions are to take multiple questions, if you don't mind, and we'll see, we'll get the answers. So, other uh, questions in the room? This gentleman over there, perhaps. And you. Yeah, my name is Rabbi Englander. I'm just trying to track the conversation. Some time ago, Iran, you said that Hamas has crossed a line. Then the conversation almost went immediately to the policies of the Israeli government and, and leadership and what they're doing wrong. Then we moved from there to a, a, a speculation as to what long-term solutions would be. So my question, Iran, is to get back to your first point. In the here and now today, what do each of you advise in terms of dealing with Hamas's invasion? Okay. All right, one more question, perhaps the person in the back there. I, I know, but there are many questioners. 
this also might be for, a, for Amal. Uh, being a realist, we know Israel is moving in. They will not stop until they get underground and excavate and get every tunnel out of there. And if it's anything like what we've seen in Vietnam, it was three tunnels, one below the other, so it's going deep. Um, and Israel would simply raise Gaza. There wouldn't be nothing left. Uh, there are refugees now already, hopefully, south of Gaza, the Gaza River, and uh, hopefully they're safe. Can they stay there for years and years and years? Can you imagine this being a refugee camp for so many years? I can't. It will take forever, for many, many years, more than five, maybe more than 10, to rebuild Gaza. How do you see this all unfolding? Okay. For your people. Okay, so Amal, if you don't mind, uh, 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 if would you each maybe perhaps answer one of those? Some, at least one, was directed at you. Um, if you don't mind answering whichever one you'd like, and you are speaking for yourself today, and you're yeah. You're uh, let me start with this: that I'm not the spoken man of Hamas. I'm not the spoken ma man of the Palestinian nation in the whole war. I'm speaking of myself. I don't have any war experience or military experience. My experience is in building a shared society, in asking uh, the hard questions. My experience is in destroying the borders and between the two societies that were built over and over, over decades. And I'm here with you in order not to try to understand what happens. Th I don't think this question is important. I'm here to talk about what will happen and, not, and also which price, we, we, which, which price we will pay for better, better reality. Is we really, really want two million people in the biggest open air prison in the world to be ethnically clean. Hamas is not a partner. It's not, I'm, I am not related to Hamas. There is the Palestinian Authority that they were ready for over two decades now in order to do any agreement. But they convinced, convinced us that there is no partner and we can handle the manage the, the, manage the, the conflict. Now is the time to see that we can't do the, say, the, same, the same things. I don't have any experience in war. I don't have any, I have experience in building shared society. And that's what I want to, to do today and tomorrow. And I want to be really determined uh, in this. I, I, I think, can't I think answer hypo hypothetical uh, also questions. I think some people might wonder whether you could build a shared society with people who <laughs> are convinced that you shouldn't be where you are. I'm not, I'm not related in your for those people. I'm related right. for the people that believe in equality, in justice, right. in humanity, and equality for all kinds. I'm not related for those, uh, for those okay. people. Um, Orly, would you like to take one and then Iran? Well, yeah, I, I, I don't have a lot to add because like Amal, I don't, you know, I am not a military expert and I don't have unfortunately clear answers as to what the, you know, what like the optimal uh, solution should be to what happened last Shabbat. I think it's clear that um, something something needs to be done uh, to, to fight Hamas because the situation as it is, as I said before, cannot continue. On the other hand, we know that, again, uh, a war like there have been a, a, a few times already is not a solution. Uh, it's not going to solve the, the conflict altogether. And it's clear that we need uh, politicians and leaders who have a vision uh, as to what is the you know long-term solution in order for us not to be in the same cycle over and over again. I think uh, it's clear that most Israelis and most Palestinians do not want this uh, endless cycles of violence. And we need leaders on both sides to be brave enough in order for us to stop this and to really reach uh, a final solution. Um, so I will say that Hamas is a murderous, jihadist terror organization 
that carried out uh, actions that remind us of what ISIS has been doing in the past decade. I think that there is no other way that, um, and we need military force in order to uproot Hamas from Gaza, but, and this is a big but, like Edna said, you she talked about a charter. Hamas is not just a military terror organization. It's a political party. It's a movement. It's an ideology. This is not something that you can kill with bullets or bombs or soldiers. It's something that when you cause damage and you inflict, especially indiscriminate violence towards Palestinians, not only in Gaza, but also in East Jerusalem and the West Bank and proper Israel, you will recruit more people to Hamas. And therefore, to the second question, I will say that terror organizations evaporate when they become irrelevant. And if we want to make Hamas irrelevant, it cannot be just a military action. We need an international commitment. And this should be an initiative started from, starting from Israel. You know, ISIS spokesperson does not go on BBC or CNN, but Hamas have assets and offices and bank accounts. If we want to isolate Hamas, if we want to eradicate Hamas, we need to use diplomatic and political maneuvers. And when Israel puts all of its chips on military action, it undermines the legitimacy of taking a different course of action. So we need a collective action, an international movement, and we need to, like, the example, and also this is to Edna, and this is also to the third question. We need to look at history. Look at what happened in Rwanda with the genocide there, and what happened in South Africa when apartheid fell, and what happened in Northern Ireland. All of these examples are not perfect uh, examples, but people through the violence couldn't have imagined a different future, but we had a different future. And if we take just Northern Ireland, what happened with the IRA, when they started negotiations, that what when the IRA got its most like legitimacy and reputation and political capital hurt. If we right now will end this military phase of um, fighting Hamas in, in military capabilities, and yeah, bombing and killing Hamas militants and going inside and, and uprooting a, a, part of the underground tunnel system in order to allow the, the residents of the Gaza envelope to go back into their homes in some sense of, of confidence. We need to leverage this military maneuver to negotiations. If we will have an Egyptian, Jordanian, Palestinian, Israeli, uh, Emirati, Saudi, American, Canadian, French, German, uh, uh, British, uh, multilateral negotiation summit saying we cannot longer try to manage this conflict. This conflict has geopolitical uh, consequences. We need to find a way to eradicate Hamas by using other means, not just military. Okay. Um, I I'd like to give the opportunity to, to those watching online to ask questions. I don't know how they're going to come to us or... Okay, Hannah has them. Uh, not well. Okay, we have a question from yeah. Zoom about whether our speakers believe that the Israeli government is making the release of hostages a priority. Maybe Hannah wants to... That's the only one. So who I, wants, I to, who I wants to take that? Yeah, I, I can start and say no. Uh, the Israeli government from the first couple of hours have said, uh, uh, Smotrich, the, the Secretary of Treasury, said that the hostages should not be a priority or taken into consideration. Some say that talking about the hostages uh, only delay uh, a deal because it raises the price. Uh, but I don't trust the current Israeli government to prioritize the lives of the Israelis uh, um, taken hostage. Uh, Right now, what we need are messages of de-escalation and a call for an immediate uh, prisoner swap, uh, humanitarian corridor, uh, some kind of negotiations, even not like even indirectly. But there should be steps taken by uh, the Jewish community 
uh, um, worldwide, and especially by governments who have hostages in Gaza, to hold the Israeli government accountable for um, violation of international humanitarian law and endangering the lives and well-being of Canadian citizens being held hostage right now. Yeah, I, I want to add, just, just to remind us that uh, the, the president, the U.S. president, uh, met the families of the hostages before Netanyahu met them, which is just unbelievable. So he spoke with them for an hour and a half, um, and Netanyahu only today uh, started to meet uh, a few of the families, and, and that really shows that it, it seems that it's definitely not a top priority for the Israeli government, um, and I agree that... Um, governments, uh, Canadian governments, the U.S. government and others uh, should uh, put pressure into first first thing, uh, releasing the hostages. I think this is something that should not be debated at all. Uh, just thinking about those uh, uh, babies and, and, and women and children and elderly uh, really um, is unbearable. So it's clear. Um, and I think there is sort of garnering more and more people here in Israel who demand uh, that this be done as the first first step. Okay, uh, another question online. So, Hannah, any other? Okay, we'll take one from the room. Okay, the woman in the corner there. Oh. Um, oh, oh, my handing is over. This question is for Orit. And at six o'clock. Who's make, who's, oh, who's sorry, Orly, I'm sorry. Um, how long do you think it will take before this this Israeli government, this coalition government, is removed? That's a good question. Uh, you know, the problem is that for this government to fall, we need uh, uh, a vote of no confidence um, uh, for this government. We have now the interim government, which is only um, in power for the term of the war. Uh, and when the war ends, then it's supposed to go back to the previous uh, composition of the government. And then we need to have a vote of no confidence in order for the government to fall and to call new elections. So it's hard to predict when this is going to happen, uh, but um, I, I suspect that we have a good chance that in 2024, uh, we may see uh, finally political change. Uh, and of course, when we get to those elections, we have to make sure that the liberal par um, um, parties are much well organized, better organized than they were in the previous elections. Um, and it's clear we have to do a lot of work in this regard to be prepared to really uh, offer Israelis um, a story of equality and justice that would be, uh, you know, appealing to as many Israelis as possible in order for us to really bring about political change. And here I'm connecting to the, you know, long-term vision of also solving the conflict of really presenting a different vision, unlike the, the lack of vision that the previous governments uh, have had uh, in the past years. Okay. We have a question from online. Um, the question is, can social media play a role to mobilize an international alternative to war as the only option? I think so Iran might want to yeah. take that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, we have to say that in this issue that the social media, especially in Israel, for those that they are seeking for another future, are really controlled now. Hospital, we had, there was a... Uh, 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 separate universe of Jews and Arabs working together to save lives. And while this was happening, the people, the, the dedicated workers of the Soroka Hospital working together in order to save lives, social media, especially Israeli Jewish social media, was exploding with incitement and anti-Arab, uh, anti anti-Muslim, anti-Palestinian rhetoric from the leaders of the country. So what we need to do is use social media to strengthen the voices of the stories of what happened in the Soroka hospital in order to tackle the voices of right now, the people who are in power, but only temporarily. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Alex and I'm uh, on the new gen council for NAF and I was also a Naomi Chazan fellow. And uh, I, I think we, we met uh, in the fellowship in January um, and so thinking about, you know, shedding light on certain certain stories, um, I'm thinking about also Aviva's reflection of thinking of, you know, what we can use to lean on 
And something that was so powerful about our fellowship trip and learn like and meeting on. lots of different activists, such as yourself, and uh, getting to meet Amal and Orly today over th Zoom, um, thinking of also about Amal and hope. So no more uh, yeah. One of the no things that really resonated with me over our trip were the stories that we heard from mm -hmm. activists of like even small wins that helped kept fueling what you were doing and what you held on to to know that you could keep doing it. So I was wondering if one of you, all of you, however much, um, could share a story, a win, or something that like we can lean on until we have our own stories and wins. Nice question. I mean, if uh, if all of you if all of you want to take it, that would be the your concluding statements, if you don't mind. Yeah. And we'd be interested in your thoughts, each of you. So why don't we start? Actually, I'm out. Why don't yeah. we start with you? So and again, I could please be brief. What oh. gives me hope right now? First of all, this conversation gives me a lot of hope. After that, I then the first day I arrived here, I got a tons of messages from my partner and my friends, both Israelis and Palestinians and also from the Arab world that asking what's, what's happening with you? Are you safe? Are your family safe? Even my friends that went to the military to fight, they remember to send me a, 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 send me a message that keep safe. Even they believe and know that we are not accepting the same thing. Something that give me hope is that two dec decades ago, we didn't have all this, this infrastructures and organization and players in the field that they keep the resilience of the people. We learned a lot and we, implement, we are implementing what we, were le what we learned. So there is no escalation now in the mixed city because what we learned and what we did and we, we, we continue to do, and this has given me a lot of hope. And the last thing, my biggest fear was that the Palestinian society in Israel will pay a huge price. I still have this fear, but the Palestinian society in Israel now is stronger because the ad the, our advocating for closing the cap, our advocating for our adv advocacy for democracy, for, for, for equality. So the Palestinian society is stronger now and we can pass over this period, but we need a partnership with, we need the partnership, we need a faith and we need to protect each other even if we don't agree in all things. Okay. So three things that give. Okay, me. thank you. Uh, Iran? So there was a Haaretz article this week about all the joint Jewish Arab initiatives from the south to the north, people opening their homes, collecting equipment, donating blood. This is a small victory that in a moment of crisis, we didn't see people rushing to their corner and adopting this tribal insular uh, reaction, but understanding that this is a shared experience. And I think that it's because of the lessons from two years ago, the, the clashes in May, that we learned there was a crisis. It was a breakdown of Jewish-Arab partnership. And we adopted a different rhetoric and terminology and mindset that brought her us to this very, very dark and difficult moment, more resilient. But also the mainstream protest movements uh, that understood that their responsibilities to open their ranks also to initiatives from the, the, the Palestinian citizens of Israel and the Arab society and not make it only a Jewish uh, defense uh, mechanism and, and Jewish civil society. So I encourage you to look to, for the Haaretz article and get some inspiration and hope from all the amazing initiatives that are being spontaneously uh, growing, but also very much supported by the NIF. The NIF has uh, an expertise in identifying these grassroots um, authentic initiatives and supporting them and doing capacity building and giving them the first couple of thousands of shekels they need to, to turn from an idea to an actual thing and to gain momentum. Thank you, Oran. Uh, I, I think that really a year ago, 
a year ago, no one of uh, no, no one expected the um, protest movements that we have seen uh, in the last month. Uh, the, the amount of Israelis who went out to the streets and went week after week because they didn't want to give up on a democratic Israel. They didn't want to give up on human rights for everyone, on equality and justice. Um, and I think in this sense, uh, we underestimated the strength and the resilience of Israelis. Um, and what we have seen in the past week is, um, as, as uh, Iran said, uh, we have seen together people working together, Jews, Arabs. Uh, we have seen uh, refugees um, in Tel Aviv uh, working to collect food and clothing to people displaced from the south of Israel. And this is also, I think, a very um, a pleasant surprise um, that we did not expect. And um, I think that um, as I said, I think the NAF really uh, put the seeds uh, to a more uh, just Israel, and then we are now sowing those seeds, and we need to believe that we have the strength and resilience to continue and to carry on, even in this very, 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 very difficult time, uh, to carry on toward a brighter future. So thank you, everyone, for, for your support over the years. So that brings um, a close to the panel. I want to thank you all for your courage and your resiliency and your hope. Uh, rather, in a dark, dark hour, rather than cursing the darkness, you are lighting a candle. So thank you on behalf of everybody here. <laughs> and now I'm turning it over to my Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so first, I do want to thank uh, Andrew for moderating today. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. I want to thank Orly and Iran, who joined us on Zoom. I know it's very late for you at a time where things are obviously, uh, anxiety and tensions are very high. We thank you. We admire your strength and your bravery. Amal to you, I want to say shukran nak. Thank you so much for not only representing yourself so movingly, but for being honest, authentic, vulnerable, and speaking truth to power. We are proud to stand with you, your family, and your people. I feel like they asked me to speak because I would not cry, but I, you're wrong. I'm crying. <laughs> um, uh, in these times when a cause for celebration so, feels so far, uh, I, we do want to celebrate something, which is your defiance. Uh, I will close the event with you in a moment, but first I just want to say a few things. I want to first say thank you to our co-sponsors, Arts of Canada, Jayspace Canada, Canadian Friends of Priest Snail, we're proud to represent a resilient part of Canadian Jewry together. As progressive Jews who care for both Jews and Arabs, these times are when we feel between a rock and a hard place. We feel for ourselves as Jews and Israelis, and we feel for our brothers and sisters among the Palestinian people. In times of terrorism and horror, we do not stop believing in peace, human rights, and humanizing the other. We derive determination from the Israelis on the ground who have lost loved ones and yet defiantly retain their humanity and steadfastly look to dismantle the endlessly violent cycle of terrorism and occupation. Um, I myself am a dual Canadian Israeli citizen and among my peer group in the diaspora, I have seen so many Jews disconnect from Israel, oftentimes from the Jewish community entirely. And there's a lot of reasons for this and many of them I understand, many of them I understand very personally. <laughs> Um, but please, I, I want to ask you all today, please don't give up on us. Don't give up on these incredible speakers. Don't give up on the people of New Israel Fund of Canada and around the world and the hard work that they're doing. We still believe that Israel has within it the strength needed to secure a true democracy and equality for all who call it home. And if you believe this too, then here's how we can help. The New Israel Fund in Canada and around the world has joined the global calls to release the hostages. We want to first thank Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie. We thank your government's actions for acting swiftly to do so, and we urge you to do more and keep bringing home the hostages safely as your top priority. And to each of you here today, you heard our speaker speak of this a little bit earlier. We also have a role to play in this crisis. One of our uh, co-sponsors on this event, our partner JSpace Canada, has a petition right now that is going straight to Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie. If you go to jspacecanada.ca, you can add your name to that petition to encourage the government to keep bringing home the hostages, our top priority. 
And I also encourage you to join the Facebook page about Vivian Sil Silver, who is believed to be held hostage in Gaza as a Canadian uh, peace builder in Israel. We are also urgently raising funding for our emergency safety net, supporting the kind of work that you've heard today from Orly and Amal in Iran. You can make a donation online, uh, nifcan.org slash crisis. Tell your friends that they too can support the most vulnerable in Israel, as well as joint Jewish Arab solidarity by giving to the new Israel Fund of Canada. The idea of our community is very simple. It's that people like you and me in the diaspora can partner with Israelis who share our values. And on that note for our guests in Toronto, uh, I do wanna share that immediately after this event, there is a group of Jewish activists and community members who have, who have organized a Shiva to grieve together at 6.30 PM. That's gonna be happening at Blur and Spadina. We do encourage you to join them. Um, for our closing reflection, Amal and I want to share with you the words of two poets important to him and to, to us both, Mahmoud Darwish and Chaim Nachman Bialik. Um, Amal, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to start. I choose these words for the, maybe the national poets for the, the both people. For the Palestinian, Mahmoud Darwish has wrote in the declarance of independence of Palestine, and he's the national poet. In and also Nachman Bialik, he rebuilt or reestablished the Hebrew language. So I will start with Mahmoud Darwish. Wanta tuiddu faturaka, fakir bighayrika, la tansa quta al hamam. Wanta tahudu hurubaka, fakir bighayrika, la tansa man yatlubuna al salam. Wanta tsaddu fatura al ma, fakir bighayrika, man yardahuna al ghimam. وانت تعود الى البيت بيتك فكر بغيرك لا تنسى شعب الخيام When you prepare your breakfast think upon others do not forget to feed the pigeons when you engage in your wars think upon others do not forget those who demand peace as you pay your water bill think upon others who seek sustenance from the clouds not atop and when you return home to your house, think upon others, such as those who live in tents. And we will continue with the words of Nahman Bialik. He wrote these words after the Kishinev pogrom. He says, Be'arur amar nakam. Nakama kazot nikama dam yelid katan od lo baraha satan. ויקב הדם את התהום, יקב הדם את התהומות המחשכים, ואוכל בחושך וחתר שם כל מוסדות הארץ נקם. And cursed be he that shall say, avenge this, such vengeance for blood of babe and maiden hath yet to be wrought by Satan. Let but blood just pierce the abyss, and pierce the abysmal black of creation, and there in the dark devour and corrode. With that, thank you all so much for coming both in person and online, and let's get to work.